Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solomon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Tim Stevenson. So Tim is a shoulder strength and conditioning specialist, and he is the owner of Dynamic Shoulders, a company which helps athletes improve their shoulder performance. In addition to that, he's been a strength and conditioning coach since 2008, working with multiple European, Commonwealth, World and Paralympic champions. So who better today to discuss how you can improve your shoulder performance than Tim? So without further ado, it's time to welcome him onto the show. So Tim, welcome to the Science of Sport podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much for coming back as well, because obviously we've had you on before, but as a duo with, uh, with Jacko as well at the same time. So it's nice to get you on uh, individually too. Um, yep. How have you been uh, since the last time we spoke? Because I think we spoke probably during COVID time, right? It was, uh, it was a long time ago. Yeah, it's a while back. A lot's happened. Um, a few changes in terms of our, well, my major business focus at the moment and what we're doing in the industry. So all has been good. It's, I think everybody had an interesting time in the last two years, didn't they? So trying to work out what life was going to look like post pandemic. But yeah, we're in a good place now. We started Dynamic Shoulders um, well, coming up on two years ago now. So we are sort of over the initial setup period, let's say, and then starting to kind of let, let it fly a little bit which is great absolutely excellent and what, what is dynamic shoulders for those who haven't seen uh, what you're producing at the moment yeah so it's kind of a if, i'll give you a bit of context of the story about how it came around really it was it's a it's kind of an amalgamation of my story in many ways in a sense of being a rugby player having dislocated my shoulder a number of different a number of times a number of occasions had two reconstructive surgeries that kind of led me into calisthenics originally which was obviously the focus of our initial conversation the first time around thinking if I could learn to handstand, then that would give me the confidence that my shoulder was stable because all of the physiotherapy and rehabilitation I'd done up until that point hadn't really got me to the stage where I had confidence in my shoulder, still felt unstable and couldn't do the things that I wanted to do with it. That was kind of like part of the story then. Within all of that, I've been a strength and conditioning coach for 15 years or so working in elite sport and lots of work in Paralympic sport. So the shoulder, what we've learned through the school of calisthenics of the benefit of maybe looking at uh, let's say athleticism and upper body literacy around the shoulder and the things that the shoulder will respond well to under higher forces and in different positions combining that with my strength and conditioning experience and also because i'm like we can kind of talk on the same level here but one of the things i loved about paralympic sport which is where i spent a lot of time was the complexity of it and i was like looking out at the industry and going like nobody's really got a good handle on the shoulder. If you go to a conference, you're going to hear people do presentations around squat, deadlift patterns, hinge patterns. You're going to go and read journals. You're going to look at the majority of the journal articles in any monthly publication. It's lower body focused. People are sort of steered away from the shoulder, not really understanding what's required to optimize performance in the upper limb very well outside of the physiotherapy space. It's probably worth saying. So that was kind of where the opportunity presented itself. Being there, I know what it's like to have a shoulder which doesn't stay in the right socket, in the right place, and some experience of making sure that it does stay in the right place and thought that was going to be valuable to, to share with some other people. Absolutely excellent. So obviously that's, that's kind of how you've got into it, and we're going to discuss the shoulder. So before we get into all the nice bits of like how to, to exercise and all the sets and reps and the nuts and bolts of it, what's the structure and function of the shoulder joint? This is it. I told you when like, we were going to come on that this could go on. So I'm going to try and keep it. <laughs> Take your like, time. Do as, as much as you need. It's all good. I'm going to try and keep it top level and not lose people in function anatomy. <laughs> my, my place always starts with this, and particularly with the shoulder. As a top level, like, we kind of put a strap line about um, respect to the design of the shoulder. So performance driven by design. And that, is, I think, is where it's worth starting of what is the functional anatomy of the major kind of considerations around the shoulder. Because, like... I've been in presentations before and I've seen content online where people are like, oh, it's kind of a ball and socket joint, so it's like the hip. So let's just treat it the same as the hip. Oh, it's not the same as the hip. Like I saw Ben Patrick from Knees Over Toes being like, if you want to improve shoulder extension range of motion, just get into a deep dip position and just hang out there for like two minutes. And I'm like, well, you can do that in a lunge pattern because the hip is going to be like sat in a nice deep socket, super stable. The biomechanics of the joint are set up so that you can get away with that. You go and sit in a deep dip position for two minutes. That humeral head is going to have a horrible time just riding forwards in the socket because there's nothing to stop it. So it, it is worth thinking about it in 
as the design of that of the shoulder. So we have four joints essentially that constitute what often we would refer to as the shoulder. Everyone would often think about the glenohumeral joint. We've got our scapula thoracic, so we need to consider the rib cage. The scapula thoracic is a false joint. You've got the scapula essentially suspended in space on the rib cage and held there by muscle forces. And then we've got our sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints. All Can you four... take us through what they are quickly? So for those who haven't got a textbook in front of yeah. them, like obviously ball and socket, that one's obvious, scapula is your shoulder blade. What are the little extra bits? Yeah, so you, we've effectively got the, like you, if you think about the collarbone or the clavicle, it's almost like a strut which attaches the, the thorax, or let's say it almost helps to suspend the shoulder away from the body so that the shoulder can do what the, 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 its function, which I'll come to in a second. So your sternoclavicular is going to be your collarbone attaching to the sternum, so, so midline on the, on the rib cage, and then the acromio or the, the uh, acromioclavicular joint is going to be the joining of the roof of the shoulder, which is a little bony piece which sits on the top of the scapula, which is called the acromion process, and then the end of the clavicle, so acromioclavicular joint. So it's that that strut essentially of like just holding the shoulder out there, suspending it, so that the scapula can then move on the rib cage and the humeral head can move in the socket. The, the, the difficulty that, that a lot of people have with the shoulder is that the humeral head is three times bigger than the socket that it sits on, whereas the hips kind of sits in a nice deep socket, it's, it's kind of engulfed by it almost. But we've, because the shoulder joint is designed for mobility, you have to trade something off. You can't have a mobile and stable, super stable joint. So because we want the mobility, we therefore see a lack of stability. So we have this situation where the whole humeral head can't be in contact with the fossa, the socket on the scapula at one time. So we have this kind of like fine motor control that's required as you want to move your hand around in space, the scapula needs to track with the humeral head. So think of it like um, you've got to keep the ball on the socket and the socket on the ball. Sometimes people liken it to a golf ball on a tee or a seal balancing a ball in its nose. Those are kind of partly accurate representations of, of the shoulder would do help you to kind of picture a bit of like the task at hand. So there's obviously, there's a lot going on, right? And you're trying to produce mobility and stability at the same time. Um, how does that then lead to the, the function of what the shoulder is doing? Yeah, I think the simple, I like this kind of question around the function because it depends what context you put it in. But if you go from a human movement perspective, the shoulder's job is to position the hand in space. That's what the brain is interested in. Task focus, what do you want to do with your hand? Okay, shoulder's going to position you there. The intensities, the duration, all that kind of stuff that we put on it through a sports and physical training perspective change the demands and the, the function requirements of the shoulder. But we've also got this function where the shoulder is going to help to transfer forces from the hand or to the hand through the kinetic chain. And it's another piece that sometimes is goes often overlooked is that you can't think about the shoulder as an island by itself and we just go let's just train that piece it needs to be considered as part of the entire movement system um, so that we can actually then functionally do stuff a, a really good example of that is grip strength so grip is directly correlated to rotator cuff function the rotator cuff effectively creates a stabilizing force and, and controls the position of the humeral head on the socket so it's really important of, of keeping the ball in the socket and the socket on the ball so if you think that you want to grip something you squeeze your hand your shoulder will automatically create stability because it, the brain knows that i'm going to have to try and transfer some forces so there's there's quite an intricate um design and architecture to the shoulder which is therefore why it can sometimes be a little bit challenging for people to, to manage and people that get shoulders which feel a bit grumpy and banged up often kind of experience that for some time if they don't get to the root cause of, of why because there's so much going on that needs to be kind of coordinated and orchestrated for it to work well. And when we put that in a sporting context, and obviously yeah, grip, grip strength can be a, a sport in itself, but most people aren't sitting there with a hand grip dynamometer <laughs> trying to measure yeah. how, how strong they are. Um, you do that when you get one, but like you're not doing that for your sport. So um, in, in a sporting context, what, what role does the shoulder play there? And you kind of alluded to the, the force transfer through to the hand, but yeah, what, what's the shoulder then doing in a range of different scenarios when it comes to, to movement? So... I think if you, if you kind of take a step back and go, what can the shoulder do? 
where we can, it's the major driver of the fastest movement in sport, which is a baseball pitch. So I, don't, I don't even know. The baseball team will tell you, like the guys will tell you that it's like, how many degrees per second? I don't know off the top of my head. Um, we've also then got like, so that range of motion, the, the, the velocity that it's able to create, we've also then got it through to, it's the main point of contact in a rugby tackle. Um, we can pull that into so many different, different contexts and what's required of the shoulder in those different environments is going to change. Some of the things that are really worth considering though is how fast do we need to be able to move the shoulder and the impact or the role of creating dynamic stability around the shoulder. So take rugby as a good example. That was my sport and background. If I'm going to go and make a hit and I've got my, my shoulder or well, my hand out to the side, I'm going to go and make a tackle. Does, we have to have the functional ability within that, within that environment to handle the chaos of the hip but to create enough stability because of the architecture of the joint to stabilize the shoulder so that we can a protect it but then b also transfer forces through it if we can't fire the stabilizing musculature around the shoulder fast enough then it leaves that shoulder which is as we said before very mobile open to potential disruption so i think that's where we often start with the end in mind from a what's the function of the shoulder question and go what do you want to do with it you can do anything you want with it because we have all this range of motion so many degrees of freedom movement options and things that we can do speeds durations all that sort of stuff and then asking the question well what do you want to be able to do with your shoulder and then how do we condition the shoulder for the intensity duration movement specific patterns but through all of that You've got to remember, you want to make a, a hit, you want to serve a tennis ball, you want to do a snatch, like whatever context, you've got all those four joints all working together. The articulation of the scapula and the humerus, keeping the ball in the socket, like there's all that stuff going on. And it's how we then sort of can optimize the training process to make sure that shoulder with all that stuff going on can do that thing that you want to be able to do. Which, which is almost begging me to ask the question, how do we do that? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, when it comes to the performance side of it, how are we going to train a shoulder to, to be performing optimally in all of those different possible scenarios? There's some real simple things that I think are easy wins for people. So I, I also think you'll probably have seen this, like this is social media people. When, when I see coaches put stuff out like, you don't need to train external rotation if you're training through range of motion. I'm like, hmm depends on on what baggage you're bringing to the table because there's a lot of people like i do a lot of work in crossfit now so we get lots of people go i used to play rugby dislocated my shoulder so what i did was took up crossfit loads of overhead stuff under fatigue nice one <laughs> yeah so it's a, it's a perfect combination um so those people training and, and, and okay, people can kind of see what they like about crossfit i like it as a as a, as a methodology of training it's got some faults but so does everything but ultimately, most people, if you've had a shoulder issue in the past, or we are going to be training through repetitive movements, same patterns, just like hammering tennis balls all the time. As with anything that we would do with human movement, we're going to need to offset some of the potential compensations that we're going to see as a result of repetitive movement patterns. So one of the things within that, we'll be thinking about how do we optimize and maintain good uh, coordination, control, rhythm around the shoulder. Sorry if you can hear that police <laughs> car. I, I don't know if they're off to you or someone else, mate, but yeah, we can. Literally like it sounds like they're outside. Um, <laughs> I think they've gone. So <laughs> control around the shoulder, no worries. So we often talk about like maintaining the force couples, right? There's two things, maintain the force couples. So if we can keep the ball in the socket and the socket on a ball that sets up for a really good place. So that would be cuff strength. So is your rotator cuff strong enough? Is it got the capacity to be able to do what you're asking it to do? So if you are, often we'll see people in um, high, in, high volume, high endurance type sports have shoulder problems when the rotator cuff gets tired. And the research will indicate again that fatigue is a primary cause of, of shoulder injury. Because if, the, if, we, if we can't keep the ball in the socket, because the muscle, the, the rotator cuff gets tired, then it's liable for some uncontrolled translation of the joint. So cuff is the one thing. So, and that's like, everyone kind of points and laughs at therabandic external rotation work that they might've seen from the physio, but it has its role and its place. And, and oftentimes it's required. 
because it would detrain for, for a lot of people. And then the other thing is, can we maintain that scapular movement and control? So many people struggle or get pain in overhead positions or feel unstable because the scapula is not rotating enough around the rib cage. So when we go overhead, that scapula needs to move up and around the rib cage so that it stays, the humeral head, or the, the, the fossa on the scapula, the socket, stays in contact with the head of the humerus. So those two structures are working together. If that scapula can't upwardly rotate enough, then the brain is kind of like, oh, I'm going to try and find a different way to, to execute this movement for you because I need to position my hand in that specific place in space. So then we're kind of like opting for option B, C, D, and E because primary option A is not available. So we now can't sort of junk up the shoulder. And if it's not, if we do that too much, then we're potentially also then going to have a, have a bit of a problem with it. So those are the two things. Can we keep the rotator cuff strength appropriate for the task that we are looking at doing? And if we're going to move overhead, can we keep the scapula moving well enough with the more appropriate muscle force? And remember, as I said, with the scapula particularly, we've got that, that bone effectively just sat suspended in space. I think there's like 17 muscles which attach to the scapula. Eric Cressy did a nice analogy where he says, imagine it like a guy rope, or, sorry, a canvas with guy ropes attached. If we've got some guy ropes that are too tight and some that are too loose, it's going to distort the, the tension on the canvas. Then the same thing will happen with the scapula. If we've got too much stuff pulling it in one direction, which will often be into downward rotation and not enough force pulling it up and around the rib cage, then it's just a simple issue of muscle balance being out of whack, but it has a big impact on the potential from a shoulder performance perspective. Shall I pause there or do you want number two? Oh, but crack on with number two because I'm only going to ask you how to train it otherwise. So go, <laughs> okay. go on for number two. The second bit that we'll be like for people to think about is dynamic stability. So think about, as I said before, we've got this humeral head, which is three times bigger than the socket that it sits on. We often go in the gym and our upper body protocols are bench, row, press, sagittal plane based movements. But then we go on the sports field and all of that happens outside of those positions so like we're very good at bench pressing but how relevant to a rugby tackle is bench press actually so if you take it from a contextual perspective we are on a bench press lying flat on a bench supported by the ground so we're super stable and then we're pressing in a very limited and pretty rigid pattern now going to a rugby pitch or somewhere i've got some level of chaos and you're going to be having to use or wanting to apply that strength in a wide range of positions and patterns in the different context, speeds, velocities. So yes, it maybe has a place, but it's certainly not the final solution for keeping your shoulder healthy. Some of the stuff that we would, I'm really big on is using gymnastics rings. So if I rather than go bench press, if I flip somebody into a ring push up, they now have to control their, let's say core pillar strength, the kinetic chain, you're self supporting yourself on the rings. The ring's going to move. So now the shoulder's got this dynamic stability challenge of creating stability in an environment which is unstable. We can then work through, you can, there's different ways you can scale it so you can like lean on the straps for support or not lean on the straps for support. We can put weight vests on, we can put bands over the shoulders. There's so many ways that we can now start to go and train the shoulder under, let's say, four, five, six repetition max type intensities in an environment where the shoulder is having to dynamically stabilize and transfer forces through the chain because we are now self-supporting. If we're looking for exercises that tick boxes from a pushing strength perspective that are going to have a better translation into sport, I think you can do better than a bench press. And it's not that I'm anti-bench. I'm like, I just think people think it's the holy grail. It's not from a shoulder health perspective. And then we kind of go with the rings. You can then start to go, well, let's see what that looks like if we go into an archer position. So I'm now going to go and take one arm out to the side. When we're in that position, we can train with decent high level forces. The brain is now getting context of what is it like to be strong in that position. And that's very much like a position which I might find myself in on a rugby pitch. So we're just starting to kind of, again, go back to what I said right at the start of respect the design of the shoulder or, or performance driven by design. The design of the shoulder is such that it's, it's going to do really well if we make it more athletic, if we give it more physical literacy and we expose it to appropriate forces in all the different ranges of motion the shoulder can move through. 
that then starts to mean that we've got a shoulder which is prepared for the task that we're going to expose it to and, and again link that piece into what we're we actually trying to achieve and what positions are meaningful to us from a performance output perspective. Absolutely excellent. I think that, that touches on some really nice applied stuff. And for the for the first kind of the first point, two points then, how would you go about training those different elements? So obviously rotator cuff, you mentioned theraband exercises, but I imagine at some point you might want to progress that. Um, and that upward rotation of the scapula and overhead movements then, how do you go about yeah, ensuring that that's either optimal or at least improving using some kind of, I imagine, exercise to, uh, to, to improve that? Yeah, I think for most people, if you're listening to this and you've had a shoulder problem in the past, you can, if we were to fire a bit of a shotgun at it, like I've got three exercises that I'll do prior to an upper body based session and I'll, I'll kind of share those with you because it give people a starting point. So I'll typically do something external rotation strength wise. So that could be on a cable, it could be with a band. There's a number of different progressions within it as to how we start but like let's go level one you've not done any cuff work before you've got a shoulder which is a bit grumpy when you're pressing into an overhead position or it feels a little bit unstable now i won't go into details of whether you go internal rotation versus external rotation because there's a little bit of a just a difference there but let's go most people benefit from doing some external rotation work at the shoulder so we lie on a side we put a towel underneath the elbow and the rib cage so the elbow is just slightly away from the body we're going to grab a two to three, four, five kilo weight, and we're going to work through some real simple external rotation work. And I want, I want like four second eccentric control on the way down. Work up to 12 to 20 repetitions to begin with. We can scale that intensity. People are not doing 12 repetitions. or don't, I'm definitely not doing 20 on a four second eccentric. Those people are the people that need to do it because you will avoid the things that you're not very good at. It takes some time. Burns like crazy, but the reason you need to do it is because you're crap at it. And like, if we, if we think that the rotator cuff is 50% roughly type one fibers, so slow twitch and 50% type two, we're great at a type two, but we like that bit, right? Heavy barbells and chuck this stuff around. When do we train capacity like under control? So we need to go and nudge that endurance side of the shoulder to make sure that it's, it's got that, that element and that, that performance attribute as well. So it's sideline, it's still a rotation. I can send you some videos to attach into this one. 20 reps, four second eccentric. Stop complaining, get it done. It will help your shoulders. The second bit would then be something like a W to Y, a cable scaption to a Y position, something where we're starting to encourage that scapula to move. Like level one, super simple stuff so you can feel it would be a single arm wall slide. So get a foam roller, put it up on the wall, put your forearm on the wall, start at 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. So just elbow out in front of you and you're gonna push up, but you're gonna think about pushing the hand with the scapula. So we're gonna drive from the scapula to try and get that scap to start to upwardly rotate. This is a really good one if you've got anybody who feels that kind of pinching pain on the top of the shoulder when they press overhead. Because if we can get that scapula to move, the acromion, the acromion process moves up as well as that scapula rotates, which creates more space underneath the shoulder, underneath the chromium process between that and the humeral head, which stops some of that kind of, or may stop some of that pinching kind of feeling that people are experiencing as well. So cuff will help, rotator, um, and then the rotation, upper rotation of scapula will help with that wall slide, just drive it through. You need to do eight reps, keep it controlled. It's like a mobility type exercise to facilitate upper rotation. And then I will stick all that together, and this is where the Celtic chain piece comes in, and I'll go and try and do something which is going to get the shoulder to be part of the rest of the chain, potentially. So I would probably, let's go for, you could do something like a ring push-up, we could, like I just talked about. You could also do something like a, if we're gonna do an overhead pressing session, inverted kettlebell shoulder press, grip it hard so that we can get that grip strength going, which we talked about before, which is all is gonna fire the, the stabilization system in the shoulder. We're going to have to control it because it's task based now. So now the brain's interested because it's like, don't let that kettlebell fall off either side. So like a constraint, the brain will then be like, okay, I'm going to get into this position to be able to do that. Press overhead, control the eccentric deceleration phase because people are really lazy at eccentric overhead strength. People can't be asked to do it, let the bar fall. So we're missing out on that whole like piece of a, of a, of a muscle or joint movement. Um, and now sometimes we'll do that in a rear foot elevated split squat position as well. So you're going to go rear foot elevated split squat, 
uh, kettlebell in the right hand, left, ha left foot on the ground, and I'm gonna just go and link those two things together. So I've now got hip working, shoulder working, a little bit of instability to get the, the, the pillar strength or core stability kind of firing as well. I like just ticking these things together and then going, right, I've now given the shoulder what it needs. So we've looked at uh, the protective force couples. So we've looked at the rotator cuff, keep the ball in the socket. Our upper rotation through our serratus wall style is keeping the socket on the ball. And then the dynamic stability piece, I've gone and challenged with an inverted kettlebell and link that into the kettle chain. Three things, if you're going to do anything for your shoulder health, put those in the program and do it enough consistently and your shoulder will get feel better. Absolutely excellent. And obviously that, that kind of leads into some injury prevention stuff as well. So yeah, can you can you talk to how you can prevent injuries for the shoulder? Because like you, you've mentioned already a number of different scenarios where someone comes in, oh, I've got this little thing in my shoulder and I can go from, oh, it hurts a little bit when I do this through to, yeah, that's hanging out of the socket and that's not good. Yeah. Um, so how how do you then start to reduce the injury risk through um, training the shoulder? I think it's, the, it's kind of the same process. I think one of the things when we started Dynamic Shoulders, I was very aware that if you were working with strength and conditioning coaches or personal trainers, and I used to be a strength and conditioning coach who didn't really understand what the scapula was doing, right, that, like some time ago. But if we're being honest, if we took an athlete with a group of coaches and asked the athlete to take the shirt off and said to the coach, tell me what's happening with that shoulder, people wouldn't be able to give you a particularly accurate breakdown of, of the, any potential positives or potential less than optimal movement patterns that we see because you don't understand what's happening from an anatomy perspective. So the first thing is if you've got, if you're working in an overhead sport or something which is like upper body dominant, or if that's your sport and that's what you're doing, I would just have some kind of regular touch points in my training week of look after your rotator cuff, doing the same thing as what I've just explained. Um, if you're in an injured state, it changes because it might need some more kind of specific intervention. But if you kind of just in that place where the shoulder grumbles every now and again, like you don't want to you try and stop it from getting banged up. Like I don't think anybody has been through our program in the last two years that hasn't had some rotator cuff work and scapular work, like on a re on a, like a reconditioning type program. And I just think it's it because because of the kind of the where we can the things that the shoulder needs what we expose it to on a daily basis from sitting and driving in Netflix. And, and then we come in and we do the same patterns with swimming or playing tennis or whatever, that you just got to go back to what I've said about the design and go, actually it makes sense to make sure that, that ball is on the socket. So a, one or two sets, each session of a rotation work for or some cuff work or some stability work or some scapular kind of like YTW type stuff. Like it doesn't take long. And, and those are people who have listened to this who've had a shoulder problem before be like oh, it's a pain in the ass to get fixed and it, it impacts everything because like every day is shoulder day right you deadlifting it's still shoulders like push pull press it's all shoulders um so i would still go down the same route of, of that exact same principle of, of just looking after the shoulder from a isolated perspective but then the other thing that i would do is just look at substituting some exercises in during certain phases of training. So if you are only ever benching, seated shoulder pressing, barbell pressing or whatever, I would be having a look at some other exercises which are going to challenge the shoulder in different ways, particularly with the dynamic stability and kinetic chain integration piece. So let's say you wanna go like wall walks into handstand position, closed kinetic chain, like lots of really good stuff happening in there. Um, pike push-up positions using the gymnastics rings we do a lot of hanging type movements as well because of the benefits there from a shoulder perspective ground-based movements like put some of this in your program and it's not people go oh, it's easy i've got pressed dumbbells like you can make this stuff like savagely difficult if that's what you're after and expose yourself to things that you can't do that is like you know, if, if people take one thing away from this, you go, oh, I don't like hanging because I'm not very good at it. Like, that's exactly what you need to do. Like, do more of that thing because it's the opportunities for development within that are huge. Um, we have like a, a, one of our programs that we have a, 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 a generic type program that people can use. We put down a set of eight benchmarks. And when, if you can do these things, your shoulder's in a good place to perform well. So that would include some, each of those things that I've said, some work around localized 
um, stabilization, cuff strength, some work around ground-based movements, some hanging patterns, and some inverted kettlebell pressing movements. Get those nailed down. The shoulder has what it needs in the most part, and it should be performing well for you. Absolutely excellent. So when, when you bring all of this together, I'm, I'm really interested to see what, a, a, let's say, an upper body trip session with you might look like. So if, if I was to come into the gym, um, I'm going to come in and I'm going to do some kind of upper body session with you. Um, what might a session like that look like? Yeah, we, 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 we walk in, we go straight to the bench press. We don't warm up at all. And we, <laughs> that's what I see so people do. Max, like. done. Thank you. Yeah, just like, so that's, we're gonna... that's my day. I'm, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do bench, which we'll warm up with bench. Um, that legitimately happens in CrossFit though. Like it's a snatch session. So let's do snatch as a warm up. I'm like, so we can do better. So <laughs> joking aside, see it as like, if the major sections, depending on what our training phase is, we're going to do something for mobility, if that's a limitation for us. Um, people in the research will argue about it until they're blue in the face. I have been working in this industry for 15 years and I've seen and felt the benefits of self myofascial release for a number of different reasons. Whether the research can prove it or not, I'm not bothered. It works and people feel better when they do it. So I would generally start with some kind of like uh, massage work if we needed it. I won't go into details of why I think that works because it's not just about what's happening at a tissue level, but it works, right? And if it optimizes the rest of the session, then it's a good thing to do. So from there, from any mobility work we needed, we would go into some control work. So control could be stability, but that will be typically touching base with some cuff work and some scapular kind of movement work, making sure that those two things are squared away because if they're not, we're going to have a problem down the line. We might throw a bit of priming in there. So rate of force development work, the shoulder might need to be able to learn to kind of fire quicker. So we could be doing some upper body plyometric type work. And then we'd get into some strength based progressions from there, which might look like, let's say if we were to go like hard into a dynamic shoulder session, like we might have, and it's not, this is, this is at all anti barbell kettlebell. We use all that sort of stuff from landmines to presses. It's all on the table. It's just, that it's also, um, mixed in with, let's do some single arm hanging type work. Let's see if we can double arm hang. Can we shift across? Can we single arm hang? Can I hold active hang in that position? If you've got somebody who can hold their body weight on a single arm and hold it in the socket, we've got a decent amount of shoulder stability on that, in that person. It's a good thing for them to have. Um, we definitely do some stuff on the rings, either push or pull patterns. I'm interested in exploring different shapes. So can we not just stay in like a horizontal push and pull, but could we do some of that? And then we might also start to reach out into different overhead positions to give the shoulder some more strength out in all the other range of motion that it can move in. And then we finish with biceps. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Done. Triceps too, right? Like don't, don't well, neglect Yeah. To... I mean, they are important in making the shoulders look good, but I'm like, I am massive on, um, posterior delt work, reverse fly stuff, face pull stuff, that gets in everybody's programs because people become so anterior shoulder dominant. So my stuff will have a component of play and movement exploration and physical literacy. I, I like rope climbs. I like hanging from stuff. I like crawling patterns. And that's not like woo-woo, Edo Portal, kind of like, oh, I'm not doing that in the gym. Like we do bits of it because it, it works, but then also we'll have a single arm chest press in there because that also works so it's it's mixing it together based on what the athlete or client needs and then ultimately again back to the point of what are we trying to achieve or what is our performance outcome or measure absolutely excellent so tim massive thanks for your time and effort today it's been a really interesting podcast and i've really enjoyed it uh, where can people find a little bit more about you and what you're up to yeah so we are dynamicshoulders.com. you can find us there from our on our website our most uh, I say actually our only prolific channel is if we can only handle one at a time on these days with social media is Instagram and that's at dynamic shoulders. We put tons of content out on there. So if there's anything that you've heard that you're interested in, um, there's loads of exercises you can come and find on our page and then yeah, drop us a, a, an email if you want any more details. Hello at dynamicshoulders.com. Perfect. Tim, massive thanks for today. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to speaking again soon. Thanks very much. Cheers, buddy. And that's it once again. A massive thanks to Tim for all of his hard work on today's podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm sure you do at home too. Before you leave, I want to point you in the direction of the Science Sport Coach Academy. Well, the Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses broken down into bite-sized chunks. So if you've enjoyed today's podcast and you want to get some more great sports science information, get yourself into the Coach Academy completely for free using the link in the show notes in just a few seconds time. 
What's more, if you complete a course, you'll get a certificate of completion, which means you can prove your ongoing education. And if you've enjoyed today's podcast, it'd be fantastic if you could recommend us to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. That means that we can keep bringing the best possible guests and best possible content. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks from me. I'm Matt Solomon for Science and Sport, and I'll speak to you next week.